So last Tuesday, Governor Chris Sununu apparently really hurt the feelings of a lot of Republican senators in Washington when he told them that their life was not for him. His decision not to run for Senate shocked many Democrats as well, but they're probably not as bent out of shape about it. Of course, many are asking, what does Senator Maggie Hassan, the incumbent, think of all this? And today, we get to find out, presumably. Senator Hassan is our guest this morning. Thanks for joining us in studio. We Thanks appreciate for having me. I really appreciate it. So you've been gearing up for what would have been on paper this epic campaign battle that's not going to happen now. So one, were you surprised by the governor's decision? And two, do you now have to spend more time convincing your fellow Democrats, especially on a national level, that you're still in a race for this seat that is going to go down to the wire? Well, Adam, anybody who thinks this isn't going to be a tough race is sorely mistaken. Uh, New Hampshire voters are famously independent, as they should be. We are a purple state. Um, my margin last time was very, very slim. Uh, so my focus continues to be on um, engaging with New Hampshire citizens, listening to their priorities and delivering on them. Um, focusing a lot on how do you support innovative small businesses. Uh, we obviously need to make sure we're addressing national security issues and keeping our state and country safe. Uh, we have to lower the costs uh, for families and really grow New Hampshire's economy. Those are the priorities that I hear about from Granite Staters. Uh, those are the priorities that I continue to work and deliver on. And that doesn't change um, depending on who my opponent is. Politics attracts competitors. One of the under the radar, more fun debates uh, and head to head matchups that ever happened in the last 10 years was when you were governor and Chris Nunu was executive counselor and you guys would debate things around that table. Those were interesting, uh, compelling conversations to watch that were intense without being vitriolic. So as a competitor, uh, is there any part of you that is going to miss uh, or is disappointed that this matchup between two battle tested winning politicians from Newfields, the same town, is not going to happen? You know, this is about delivering for the priorities of people of New Hampshire. This is the work. Um, I love the work in the United States Senate because it's an opportunity uh, to come together, to work across party lines, and really deliver. And as I've always said, when you really focus on bipartisanship and you focus on different people's ideas, you can really drive sustainable solutions. And again, at a time when we are all um, hoping that we are on our way out of this pandemic, we've still got a lot of challenges ahead, this is the opportunity to do things like deliver the infrastructure bill and really make sure uh, that we're making this investment in New Hampshire's economy, getting people back to work, um, growing our economy, and really modernizing it in a way so that we will be the most competitive economy on the planet Earth. I'll take the hint there. Infrastructure bill. Uh, two, two or three projects that are coming to New Hampshire that would not have been able to be completed without this money. What are we going to get? Oh, well, look, we have a lot, as you know, red line bridges. Uh, we have roads and highways uh, that are um, may even be on our 10-year plan uh, that take a long time to get done. Um, but really important is the provisions, uh, some of which I worked on, which are to get high-speed internet to every corner, every household of New Hampshire. Um, also, affordability provisions in there as well. So it's not just about getting the broadband laid. It's also about making sure people can afford it, right? And then the other really critical aspect, among many, is clean drinking water, right? We know that communities all around New Hampshire know that they need to modernize their drinking water infrastructure. I was just in Epping uh, on Wednesday. They have to remove arsenic, right? Um, that takes enormous engineering and technical um, investment. And a lot of New Hampshire communities just haven't had the resources to do that. This bill, this infrastructure bill, brings $400 million to New Hampshire to really address those problems, including a specific amount to get communities to buy the technology they need to remove those forever chemicals, PFAS, from our drinking water. The investment in infrastructure from the federal level, obviously long overdue uh, across the country. What about inflation, though? Do you worry about this another you know, massive amount of government spending that is going to potentially continue to this dynamic that is taking this bite out of the wallets and pockets yeah. and bottom lines for families in New Hampshire. Yeah, sure. Inflation is obviously a concern, and it's really something I'm hearing about from constituents. So we got to do some things in the short term. we got to do some things in the long term, right? In the short term, we have to lower costs. Uh, so that's why it's so important, not only... Uh, in the infrastructure plan, but in the upcoming economic plan that we continue this tax cut that we did for working families. Uh, there are measures we can take to lower the costs of gasoline and uh, heating costs for families. We have an opportunity in this upcoming economic bill uh, to lower the cost of prescription drugs. So those are some of the things we can do in the short term. We also know, though, that until we get this pandemic under control, there are going to be these supply chain disruptions and these manufacturing disruptions. So 
to get our transport transportation and manufacturing sectors completely open, we got to get on the other side of the pandemic. Uh, so that means getting vaccinations into people's arms and really uh, conquering this once and for all. Um, and lastly, there are some issues that were long term supply chain issues. And we actually came together in the Senate in what we call the China Competition Bill or the Endless Frontiers Act. We passed that bipartisan basis. I was one of the lead sponsors on it uh, last spring. That really goes at how we invest in American research and development and manufacturing so that we are self-sufficient and we're not depending on other countries for uh, supply chain. You touched on the reconciliation package there. Your colleague, Senator Joe Manchin, has been trying time and again to get that number lower and lower. Your progressive colleagues would like to see it higher. Where do you stand? Are you on Team Manchin or, or do you want to go with the progressives here and go for the 3.75? Well, look, I, I am uh, looking forward to seeing the final uh, legislation that comes from the House that obviously we have an opportunity in the Senate uh, to review it. This is really about getting people back to work and growing our economy and lowering costs. Um, so I focused, among other things, on how to support small businesses in this. Uh, the House provision of this bill has uh, my provision that would double the research and development tax credit for startups. Uh, so important as a startup is trying to grow into that next stage of business development and hire people up. There are also provisions that address workforce training and the cost of higher education. We want to lower the cost. We also want to make it possible for people to get the skills they need faster and at a lower cost. There are provisions on workforce development programs um, that would be in this bill that are really important moving forward. Um, so those are some of the things. We also know that uh, lowering the cost of child care and making sure we have enough home and community-based care will help get people back to work. One of the real challenges in this pandemic is women have been staying out of the workplace because their caregiving responsibilities have been so unpredictable. So we know that there's work to do. Uh, we got to help our small businesses get people back to work, lower overall costs for families. That's what the economic plan is trying to address. I obviously have to see the details of it, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. You mentioned the workplace. Let's discuss the OSHA vaccine requirement, which is uh, being enforced for businesses with 100 or more employees, essentially saying employees must be vaccinated or they have to be right. tested weekly. A lot of businesses here in New Hampshire are looking at this and saying, gosh, I, I don't know if we can afford the testing regime and a lot of our employees won't do it. Skipping ahead a little bit, yeah. would you support lowering the threshold? Is that something that you think should go lower to increase vaccination, or is it okay where it is? Well, look, first of all, we got to make sure that it can work the way it is, and that's why I pushed um, the Health and Human Services Department in Washington just, I think it was last week, in a hearing to get New Hampshire more rapid tests, because we got to have enough tests. So they've committed to 10,000 a week for the next six weeks, and we'll continue to push to make sure that our businesses and uh, families and individuals have the testing they need. Um, look, um, requirements to get vaccinated are nothing new. George Washington required his troops to get smallpox vaccinations. Why? Because you can't fight a war if everybody's getting sick. Um, it's really important that people understand that these vaccines are safe, they're effective, they are free, and they are our ticket to getting to the other side of this pandemic. I understand that some people are hesitant about them, some people object to them, um, and you, you certainly have the right to do that. But this is about who bears the consequences of the decision of someone um, not to get vaccinated. And we've always uh, had workforce standards to make sure that our workers are free, uh, are safe and free. Um, but uh, that's really what this is about, how to make sure people have the confidence to go back to work, um, confident that they'll be in a place where uh, their risk of getting the virus is really, really low. The managers and operators of these businesses are in a bit of a pickle, though, right? Because they could lose workers that they can't afford to lose who don't want to get the vaccine. What about long term care? This is one of these ones where it's like people aren't getting the vaccine. And it's not just like, you know, it's tragic if any business closes. But in this case, these people lose a home. So what what do you support there? Do you support well, the closure of the business? You know, what, the what, public we're health seeing, what we're seeing um, is that as the vaccine requirements uh, have been imposed by employers, 
regardless of what the federal government did. So United Airlines, I think, was one of the first. Uh, people are getting vaccinated. Um, so I, I think we really have to continue to reach out to workers to find out what's holding them back here. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, long-term care and home and community-based care are really, really important. But um, you're dealing with some of the most medically fragile people there are. Um, you're putting them at great risk if you're not vaccinated. And we have had requirements for other vaccinations throughout our history. Um, those workers wouldn't be at those long-term care facilities if they already hadn't had other vaccinations. So this is about helping understand what their concern is about this vaccination and helping them uh, get the facts so that they can get vaccinated. All right, much more to get to. Don't go anywhere, Senator. And uh, we'll be right back with more from U.S. Senator Maggie Hassan. Stay with us.